I believe that there's three things that everybody needs to stay sober, no matter where you do it, whether you do it at a 12 step program or whether you do that by going to a yoga class. I think that there's three things that are needed, which are one, Welcome to Self-Made and Sober. I'm your host, Andrew Lassis, and in this show, I'm going to be interviewing entrepreneurs and other people who are not only crushing it in business, but they have also struggled with addiction in the past and are currently in long-term sobriety. And be sure to subscribe if you like what you're hearing so that you can get notified each time we put out a new episode. Today with me, I have my good friend, George Peterson. He teaches an ancient Vedic meditation technique known as primordial sound meditation, as well as yoga and Ayurveda. And I said that correct, right, George? Yes. yes Ayurveda. Good job. <laughs> we, we, we did tests on that one for like That's 20 right. minutes before. You nailed it, though. <laughs> nailed it. Awesome. <laughs> so, George, tell me about when you got sober. What's uh, your background look like? How'd you grow up? First of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. Really appreciate you having me on here and uh, super grateful for the work that you're doing. I listened to uh, your last podcast with a good friend of mine, Jesse Harless, who wrote the Cold Showers book. And I thought you guys both sounded outstanding. So <laughs> thank you. Those cold showers actually are like really working. It's crazy. This that you're seeing right here is a result of one minute wipe down with the cold shower. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I do the one minute at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My journey with recovery, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I could see started way before I actually ended up picking up drugs and alcohol in the first place. I can always see growing up that I was looking for an outside fix for an inside job is the way that I like to explain it. And what I mean by that is my first meditation teacher, Dr. Deepak Chopra, described something called a state of object referral which means your happiness is dependent upon people, places, and circumstances. And so mine was... But I really feel like I always felt this sense of fear because I had no real source of inner contentment and no really design for living that really worked. So I felt like something was missing. And so things outside of myself could provide me with some temporary relief. What that looked like in the beginning was probably a concert or a cool show to watch or a new CD to listen to. And when those things weren't around, I would tell my mom I was quote unquote bored. I know today that what that means is that I was discontent in my own skin. And how that eventually progressed to me becoming a full-blown IV drug user is I picked up alcohol, I picked up marijuana at a young age, and when I picked those things up, my life went from black and white to color. I heard somebody once say that drugs and alcohol for them was the closest thing to a spiritual awakening that wasn't one. And that was my experience. Like, Oh, that's really cool. It took the fear out of my life, even for just a second, that fear that used to just like make me so uncomfortable in my own skin. Now, you know, I always just felt uneasy and never satisfied and easily annoyed. When I picked up drugs and alcohol, that temporarily took those things away. Eventually, I was seeking my happiness in a relationship. I was in 10th grade. There was a girl in my high school who I thought was the most beautiful girl in my high school, and she wanted to go to a concert. My sister had tickets to that concert. It was a Britney Spears concert. Ah, that's why you were being vague at first. She wanted to go to a <laughs> concert, cryptic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and my sister actually got sick, no coincidences, and couldn't go. So those tickets were offered to me. And I asked her if she'd go, and she said yes. And I was like, oh, okay, this is what's going to make me happy. Because, again, I thought that fulfillment was in things outside of myself. Uh-huh. She said yes, and a couple of days before that concert, she'd asked me if I'd ever try heroin for the first time. I was 15 years old. Jeez. <laughs> I said- Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, right. And I said yes. Well, first I was scared, to be honest, because I thought I had to use a needle, and I was scared to death of needles. And she's like, no, you can just sniff it. The other thing that made me more open-minded, even though I'd heard all the bad stuff about heroin and hard drugs, was that- she was the most beautiful girl in my high school. I'm not kidding you. She was the girl who everybody was like, oh my God, like this girl is just gorgeous. And she was doing it. So I'm like, can it really be as bad as I was told it was? So I picked up heroin. And by the time I was 18, I was a full-blown IV drug user. I'm not going to go into 
story after story after story, but my life was one more attempt at drinking followed by one more failure at drinking followed by one more attempt at sobriety in the beginning, not really knowing what sobriety was just trying to not be using heroin all the time was my form of sobriety. And I would fail at that. And this cycle was repeated over and over and over and over again. The first time I tried to get sober, I uh, went to treatment because I tried to actually get sober was because I'd gone to treatment because my mom told me, you know, I got in trouble for writing bad checks. My mom caught me writing her checks and I was told if I write another one, I was going to be arrested. And this is how the disease works. I've come to understand now in recovery that I have this thing called the obsession of the mind, which is a persistent and reoccurring thought that's stronger than and doesn't respond to reason. And so after I put down drugs for 30, 60, or 90 days, that thought always creeps in and tells me I could put my hand on the hot stove one more time, and this time it won't burn me. And so I thought maybe I'll go to a different branch of the bank. I went to a different branch, and they were holding my ID for way too long. Your mom tells you if you write one more fraudulent check, this is it. And you were like, you know what the problem is? I just keep going to the same bank. So you went to the same the same bank itself, but a different branch, like a different location. Different branch. So you were kind of curious whether or not there's systems within the branch. My mind would always convince me that this time things would be different. Even if the idea that it was trying to convince me to engage in was ludicrous, it was still like, it didn't matter. Like it would always convince me that this time things would be different. And I share this only to show people the insanity and that the problem really isn't the alcohol and drugs. It's that obsession of the mind. It's my thinking. And, you know, long story short, I would keep engaging in drugs and alcohol. Cause even when I try to get sober, eventually my mind would tell me it would be different if I drank or used again. Eventually I got sober because I got beaten down to a point where I became willing to do what it took. But I always tell people in the way I really like to summarize my journey with drugs and alcohol is that my problem was never getting sober. I got sober a million times because bad stuff would happen. You know, I got arrested for eight felony forgery charges because I thought that going to a different branch of the same bank was going to lead to a different (laughs) result it was never getting sober. It was staying sober and I couldn't stay sober going back to the initial idea because I was restless, irritable and discontent in my own skin. How many failed attempts before we'll say this one is the one that stuck. How many would you say is a ballpark estimate of how many times? Probably hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of this time is the time. And you meant it like in your core. I tried to get sober for the first time at 18 when I went to treatment. I was trying to get my mom not to press charges against me for those checks I'd gotten caught writing. And I didn't get sober till right before I was 23. In between that time in the beginning, I wasn't really serious because I was young and I just wanted to get rid of my charges. But eventually, like I started to hit real bottoms Uh where I felt totally hopeless on the inside. And so when I'd hit this place, I'd, try to do anything I could to get sober, but I still wasn't at a place where I'd been beat down into a place where I'd be willing to go to any lengths. That willingness to be able to go to any lengths, you think that's sort of what got you to the point that you were able to start taking advice from other people or how did, you know, how did you figure out how to get sober this time? This was like the millionth time I'd sworn off drugs and alcohol The difference is, is that, you know, I was at a free concert, somebody handed me a drink. I knew I shouldn't be drinking because I was around people who only wanted to spend their time around me when I was sober. I was actually around a best friend who I had lost my relationship with them because of my drinking and my drugging. Mm -hmm. And they'd gone out, they went to a concert with me and this girl hands me a drink and I knew I wasn't supposed to drink it. But that obsession of the mind was still there because I hadn't had like a psychic change. My outlook and attitude upon life that would always drive me back to drinking and drugging was still there. And so when she handed me the drink, I had no defense against that drink. And I pretended to take a sip 
And then my mind, because that's just how it works. Like I know today that if I'm a real alcoholic and a real drug addict and I don't have a toolkit laid at my feet to get sober, that the time and the place will come where I will drink or use again. And so the time and the place came, I was 89 days sober and my mind told me, she saw you pretend to take a sip. So now you got to take a real one. And I took one sip of the drink and I instantly felt dead. Like I'd been shooting heroin for like 10 years straight. On so you had a, almost three months sober and just one drink brought you immediately back. Yeah. And I mean, I'd hit way worse bottoms in the past, but it was just like something happened in that moment where I was at this place in my life where I had this realization where I was going to keep going on the way I was going and die or I was going to get help. And I called the person who's now my mentor in recovery and then just said, I'm ready to do it somebody else's way. And that's been the biggest difference is I've stopped trying to think that I know how to get sober. And instead, you know, one of my favorite quotes, and I think this could add a ton of value to anybody who's listening, who's maybe newly sober, or even you've been sober a while and you want to take your life to the next level, success leaves clues. Or like we say sometimes in like different 12 step groups, find somebody who has what you want and do what they do. And that's what I did. I found people who had what I wanted in their life and I started to take suggestions and taking suggestions is what I still do and what has got me not only sober, but in a position where now I'm able to thrive as an entrepreneur in recovery. Are there any instances that come to mind of times where you maybe took the mentor's advice and in your head, you knew that it was going to not work out and you took it anyway. Are there any times that you can think of where you, you went against your own better judgment and maybe things worked out or didn't, but having the willingness to do it? In the beginning of sobriety, especially, you know, I just, you know, here's the thing though. I'd been trying to get sober for five years on and off. So by this time I'd had enough trial and error with trying to do things my way and not succeeding that at this point I was beat down into a place where like pretty much unless the kid told me to go kill myself. Wow. I was going to do it. I, it's, it's funny though, because I was also in that situation when I first, first got sober and the guy who was guiding me, I remember that this guy who I was living with in my halfway house he was like, Hey man, you and me, we're going to move out. It's going to save us a whole bunch of money and we're going to go to this place. And I was like, okay, cool. And then I talked to my mentor and he's like, <laughs> he's like, how many people are you sponsoring right now? That was his response. I had sent a mass text to 10 different people. Or actually I take that back. He wasn't, he wasn't my mentor at the time. It was the guy who was mentoring me is mentors, mentor. So like great grand mentor in the, uh, <laughs> and sure, I got you. and so I had sent out a mass text to everybody I knew that that didn't live in a halfway house at that time because I wasn't that well connected in Florida. I had maybe maybe <laughs> six months sober at the yeah. time, and so I sent out a mass text, and you know you could send it to ten people at once, and so I knew nine people, and then the tenth one, sure. I sent it to my great grand mentor. And everybody's response is, you should move here. You should move there. Da, 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 this place is great. It's good. Blah, 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 this and that. And his response is, how many people are you helping? One-on-one. -on -one, how many people are you giving guidance to? Sure. And I was like, well, the answer, I mean, it's none. I don't have a whole lot of sobriety. He said, your next move is to stay exactly where you are. And against my better judgment, because in my head, I was like, this is a dumb idea. But I said I was going to listen to anybody that knows what they're doing. So the guy who moved out, he got his own place. And in the halfway, you know, this is unbeknownst to me and how the universe just kind of unravels everything for you. That guy moved out. He had, he had seniority mm, in the halfway yeah. of all the people that were there. I was next in the pecking order. And so they had two different houses and the co-owner he was the house manager at the really, really nice house. I was living in the whatever house. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't the nice one. So the co-owner, he decided he sure, didn't want to live in the house anymore. And they were like, well, Andrew's got the most time. So they moved me into that house. So I got an upgrade in house. And because I was the house manager, I got free rent. Then compounded on top of that, 
someone offered me the opportunity to do uh, my first startup. And I originally told him, no, I was like, it's too risky. And I was like, well, I'm not paying rent. Maybe now's the time. And that turned into what snowballed into rush tech support, which has almost been in business now for five years. We've done over 10 million in sales and we've had probably 200 some employees, sure. uh-huh. give or take currently, currently maybe like 30, 35, but the snowball effect of taking sure. that advice that I knew was the wrong idea because in my head, Trip and I are supposed to move out. It's too expensive to live in this halfway. And I stayed against what I thought was best for me. And hands down, I look at that moment in my car texting. I knew nine people and I sent the 10th one. And that response literally changed my life. But exactly like you're saying, it was that willingness to listen to people regardless of what I thought because my best attempts landed me in rehab. Like I wasn't trying to ruin my life. I just did my best and ended up in rehab. Well, I think too, that principle can apply to anybody, no matter where they are in life, having an addiction or not, that success leaves clues. Find people who have what you want and do what they do. Meaning find what, find people who, you know, are spiritually in the place you want to be in. Find people who are mentally in the place you want to be in. Find people who are emotionally in the place you want to be in. Find people physically who are in the place you want to be in and ask for help. That's one of the biggest things I've learned in sobriety is ask for help. I believe the collective is more powerful than the individual. It doesn't matter how you get sober. I believe there's three keystones that we need. I mean, if you're an alcoholic or a drug addict, you have the hopeless variety, meaning unable to stop or moderate, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. I believe that there's three things that everybody needs to stay sober, no matter where you do it, whether you do it at a 12 step program or whether you do that by going to a yoga class. I think that there's three things that are needed, which are one, I think you need a toolkit. So I think you need a set of tools that's laid at your feet that can change your state and possibly change your outlook and attitude upon life. I think you need some sort of framework for purpose or service. I know for me, the best thing I get to do is help somebody else. What I learned in recovery is like, I came to recovery to get, I stayed to give and it's in giving that I receive. If you want success, help somebody else achieve success in their life. That's been my experience. And so I think the other piece to that though is a community. That's why a lot of 12 step programs I believe are so successful because they offer you those three things and they give you a clear framework to have those three cornerstones to one's recovery in your life. And so, you know, going back to that quote, I think finding people who have what you want, asking for their help and then doing what they do is going to cut your time in helping you get from where you are to where you want to be in half. Yeah. Easily. Easily. If not way more. Totally. I know the first, the first company I did consulting with in IT, my first year, and I tell the story a lot, but my first year we did 36,000 in sales. In our second year, we did 1.75 million in sales in our second year. So there's a huge gap between year one and year two. And I had helped somebody else start up their own company. And within a couple months, they grew their own company bigger than mine was. So, I mean, you can way more than twice as fast. I mean, they were doing it within a few months, putting that together. And I mean, it wasn't all me, you know, they've, they obviously played a giant role in it and they made it happen. Totally. But having that guidance up front, I'd say it's probably way more than twice as fast, but to your point, it moves it, it moves it way faster. Yeah. And I mean, you know, one thing that I've learned that you reminded me of in recovery is like 99% of the things that have gotten to me were, especially in early recovery, like one of the, probably the most important tool that I've discovered along my journey in sobriety and entrepreneurship to help me move from this place where I was in a hopeless state of mind and body to a place where today I feel like I'm thriving. And sure, I have my ups and downs, But when I get knocked off the wagon, it's pretty easy for me in a short period of time these days to get back on. And one of my spiritual teachers talks about, it's not about getting knocked off. It's about how quick your comeback rate is. 
and one of the tools that has gotten me to this place is meditation. Mm -hmm. And what I know today is that 99% of the things that have kept me sober have been against my better judgment, you know, relating back to that point that you made, which is like, have there been things that people have suggested that maybe I thought I had a better idea and then I took their suggestion and actually ended me up where I really wanted to be. Yeah. And now because I, I can rely on my thinking more. That's why I brought up meditation. You know, next month will be seven years daily basis, 20 to 30 minutes meditating twice a day. And which is insane because I couldn't even sit still in my own skin. Wow. And now I sit still for 20 to 30 minutes twice a day. And I'm coming up on doing that for seven years. So having done that now for seven years is the point I was trying to make. I can rely on my thinking more than I could on early, more than I could in early sobriety. But still, it's like, you better believe, even if I'm relying on my thinking and I call my two best friends and my mentors in recovery, one of them who you had on last week, Jesse Harless, and they tell me the total opposite, I'm going to take their suggestion. Because up until this point, I know that listening to them instead of listening to myself has got me way more farther along on the path I want to be on than listening to just what I think is best. And so it really is like, if you're newly sober, you maybe are just an entrepreneur looking to live your best life. Like know that 99% of the things that have kept me sober and helped me live my best life have been against my better judgment. But that's because I found people who have what I want and now I do what they do. But another important point when we bring that idea up is that I also don't take suggestions from people who don't have what I want. That's great because so many people, so many people have opinions on things, but don't have experience with them. And I, I can't agree with you anymore because, and a lot of people too, I think back to when I was starting my company, you know, and plenty of people were saying, Oh, it's risky. You shouldn't do that blah, blah, blah. You know, a lot of companies go out of business. You could lose everything. Now, five years later, they're like, we're so proud of you. We always knew you had it in you. And it's like, that's not what you were saying before. You were telling me yeah. I shouldn't do it, but these people didn't have any experience in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, I'm not saying that they were saying it to be mean or anything, but they were just, you know, giving me the morbid statistics well, of entrepreneurship and pointing out that it's a very, very risky thing. Totally. And I think a lot of it has to do with people not really knowing what they're doing. Like they, um, the E-Myth, I believe it is, they call it the entrepreneur, the, the HVAC guy. He's great at doing the heating and the AC. He knows it backwards and forwards. He can fix anything. And he decides, I'm not going to work for somebody else. I'm going to start my own company. And so he goes out and starts his own company and he's great at doing his job, but the job of an entrepreneur is not doing the HVAC at all. You know, when I yeah. started my tech company, like I was fixing the computers, I haven't touched a computer in years Yeah, because my job is to run the company. My job, you know, you could change out the tech side of it. I still have the same job. Totally. And a lot of people don't realize that they have a different job when they take that on. Well, so did you have any experience in entrepreneurship before you started on the journey that you're on now? No, I mean, I started using heroin at 15. And, um, you know, like I said, I was a full blown IV drug user by the time I'm 18. Everything I know and everything I've learned on my journey as an entrepreneur, I've learned since I got sober on August 7th of 2011. And, I've learned it all by literally following that suggestion that was given to me. Find somebody who has what you want and do what they do. My journey, obviously, we've mentioned a couple of times has a lot to do with meditation, but I believe a big part of that is that meditation, in my experience, kind of spontaneously leads us to wherever we need to be led in our life. And I believe that through picking up this, not just meditating, but the entire spiritual toolkit that's been laid at my feet in recovery. I've ran into people and I've met people and I've made relationships with people who I've been able to ask for help. And those people have given me suggestions and taught me the habits that I need to be engaging in on a daily basis to have the mindset that it takes to become an entrepreneur. If we rewind a little bit. So prior, prior to recovery, meditation was not on your grid whatsoever. Is that correct? Well, 
and I didn't even know it at the time. My mom was always into spirituality in meditation, not necessarily the kind of meditation that I practice today, but there was always like the idea of spirituality in my household. And so my mom actually had some guided meditations on her computer that she once put on like an mp3 player for me and i went on a camp out with a 12-step group once it was like a sober camp out and i remember i was like you know i was always like especially in public like i was always so afraid of what other people thought about me like i was always like so cared so much about what i looked like because i was just so self-conscious when i'm with myself by myself and i feel like that for too long i'm gonna drink again So it's like, I was always trying to look for something, a people, a place or a circumstance to help me feel better in my body because I just couldn't be with myself by myself and be okay. I was on this sober camp out and I remembered I had this, you know, I was in the spirituality. I was reading the books. I was the guy in treatment. You'd come to, I'd tell you all about the law of attraction, spirituality, and then I'd leave and I'd go shoot heroin and I'd show back up at treatment and people would be like, Law of attraction, what happened? (laughs) (laughs) So, law of attraction, what happened? I love that. And so, uh, I tried this guided meditation on this sober cookout. And I remember that just even for like a fleeting moment, and I wasn't even meditating knowing what meditation is today, what I was doing was I was sitting down, I was breathing really hard. I was listening to some sort of visualization and I was saying affirmations and I was just kind of making up what I thought I was supposed to be doing while I was listening to this guy say all this fancy spiritual stuff in my ear. All I remember though, is that there was a little bit, you know, like the pins and needles feeling when like your feet fall asleep. I felt that throughout my entire body. Oh yeah. And that, that day, at the so I can literally see the day, the sun is clear as day, the landscape, everything about that day, because the memory of what happened to me that day always stuck with me. Now wow. it's very clear, but then I think it was a subconscious feeling that had stuck with me of like, I felt that pins and needles feeling throughout my body. And it was a sensation that felt kind of cool and it wasn't being produced by anything outside of myself. And I was so used to like, I needed the girl or I needed drugs or I needed alcohol or I needed a party or I needed a concert to feel good. And this wasn't being produced by anything but me. Wow. That feeling stuck with me. So then I tried to get sober. I actually moved down to your area, down to Delray beach, Florida. And I met this guy and I got back into spirituality. I became that guy again, you know, Law of Attraction this, Deepak Chopra that, Power Now this. I was into all of that. And I met this guy who was also into that. He's like, let's download this 21-day meditation series by Dr. Deepak Chopra and Oprah. It's like the idea is like, hey, if you meditate for 21 days, it will create a new habit. And I meditated again. And I remember I felt that same feeling. And I ended up not staying consistent. And what I know today as a meditation teacher is 50% of success in meditation is determined by consistency. So I didn't get enough momentum going to achieve long-term sobriety. However, the feeling continued to stick with me. And this time when I got sober, I did that same meditation series again, and I felt it again. And this time, because I was so beat down and I was really ready to do what it took to get sober, I was like, wow. And going back to when we first started with my story, you know, my problem was never getting sober, was staying sober. And I couldn't stay sober because I was always uneasy, never satisfied and easily annoyed in my own skin. And I remembered as I started to feel that feeling again, that this feeling that meditation was giving me was actually helping me let go of that feeling that kept driving me back to drugs and alcohol. And so I was like, Oh my God, like I need more of this. Like this is helping me be content in my own skin. And that's something I could never do before. And because of that, I kept getting high. Mm-hmm. And so I called Deepak Chopra's center for well being, which is out in California. And I literally told them this story. I was 15 years old. I started doing heroin by the time I was 18. I became a full blown IV drug user. I started doing your 21 day meditation challenge. It gave me access to the inner contentment underneath my discontentment and all the discontentment I felt kept driving me back to drugs and alcohol. I need more of this. They're like, Oh my God, your story is amazing. We got to get you on a payment plan. They got me on a payment plan. I could afford, 
I went out on a week long meditation yoga retreat out there in California and I learned the technique that I now teach today, which is this ancient Vedic meditation technique. And it had such a profound impact on my life and its ability to help me access that inner contentment that I've been looking for in drugs and alcohol my whole life that I knew I had to share it with other people. And so I eventually, and I knew I needed more. And so I set the intention to go back. They actually called me and got, they want, they were so inspired by my journey. They wanted to help me become a teacher. They helped me get back there. I became a teacher. And what I tell people today is that the freedom from feeling uneasy and never satisfied and easily annoyed that I sought through drugs and alcohol, I found through my meditation practice. Wow. So what would you say if someone comes to you and they're just like, hey, George, I know I'm supposed to be meditating. It's not really for me. I've, I've done it here or there. What, what advice would you give someone that's like day one or maybe they dabbled for a bit and aren't really getting the immediate effects, where would you point them? What direction? Well, the first thing would be to find a meditation teacher, you know, and one of the reasons that I've had so much success in helping people in recovery learn to meditate is because I've been where they've been and I'm not there anymore. Yeah. And one of the things about having a teacher is they can walk you through the obstacles and pitfalls that often trip people up on their path to making meditation a consistent habit in their life having a teacher or learning from somebody who's had success with meditation and being willing to take their suggestions. That's great. Could you give sort of a rundown of what your meditation does? You had given some parallels of the, uh, the ocean. Yes. You want to touch on that? I, I love that analogy. I'd love for you to share yeah, that. So I would, thanks for asking. Yeah. This is the thing that I really love to talk about to kind of summarize what I do. I teach an in-depth, four session course in which I teach somebody how to become a self-sufficient meditator. In that course, what we teach is that there's really three main forms of meditation. One is what's called focused attention. So there's different focused attention meditation techniques, but essentially what those are, if you took the analogy of the ocean and the waves on the surface of the ocean, imagine that those are your thoughts. A focused attention meditation technique, which is a lot of the different techniques that are being practiced these days, is a technique in which you're focused on something and then thoughts or noises come into your mind and distract you. And then you bring your attention back and you focus to almost clear your mind with that point of focus. And so for me, that's like trying to stop the waves on the surface of the ocean by using a point of focus. But I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried to go to the ocean and stop the waves, it's not very easy. It takes a lot of work and it's a lot of time. (laughs) Yeah. I I, I don't know too many people that are successful at stopping waves in the ocean. Yeah. And I mean, these meditation techniques are good, like in the moment to help you feel better. A lot of the meditation techniques that are being practiced today are Uh really mindfulness where it's like, it's the art of bringing our attention back into the present. And as a result, our mind feels a little bit more relaxed in the moment afterwards. Yeah. There's another form of meditation of the three, which is called open monitoring. My girlfriend's brother practices a technique like this. It's called leaves on a stream where a thought comes into his mind and he visualizes himself putting it on a leaf and letting it go down the stream. And so the idea behind this technique is when a thought comes in, I witness it and I let it go. I witness it and I let it go. And for me, that's almost like trying to be unaffected by the waves on the surface of the ocean because they're going to come. As human beings, we have 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day and they're going to come and by not attaching to them and witnessing them and let them go. Like that's definitely more calming than allowing your thoughts to come in, attaching to them and then having them cause you suffering. But it's still, if you go back to the analogy of the ocean, not very easy to be unaffected by the waves on the surface of the ocean, which is what a lot of those techniques ask people to do. And then the meditation technique that I teach is a form of automatic Uh self-transcending. And so What I mean by that is that if you took a cross-section picture of the ocean, going back to that analogy, which means a picture of the surface in the depth simultaneously, you would see that during a storm, even, you know, during a crazy storm where there's a lot of waves on the surface of the ocean, at the place where it's a thousand feet deep, it's calm, it's still, it's silent. 
And so same with our minds. And so what we teach people is how to use the correct mechanics in that meditation is not about stopping our thoughts. It's about accessing the silence that's underneath our thoughts, but is usually overshadowed by all our mind's activity. So the big thing is we're not focusing on anything to stop our thoughts. We're teaching people the correct mechanics to be able to go from the surface where it's turbulent to the depth where it's already calm. That's incredible. So would you say that these techniques also can help people in recovery or is it just exclusive to people that are more just interested in meditation or is there overlap between them? No, I mean, there's huge over, and this is why actually it's my goal to get as many people, especially people who are in recovery in the world meditating. Um, that's kind of the number one goal I have for myself is to share meditation with as many people in recovery as possible. And more specifically, this meditation technique, you know, there's so many parallels. I would say that the biggest parallel is that when people seek a change in their emotional state and they don't know how to produce that change from within, they reach for something outside of themselves. Like I said, I was restless. I was irritable. I was discontent in my own skin. And I didn't know how to produce a change in the way I felt any from within. So I reached for things outside of myself. And the one way I knew to feel better right away was shooting heroin. And so when people seek that change and they don't know how to produce it from within, they reach for something outside of themselves. And what meditation does is it redirects our search for peace from the outside in. And so through meditation, I've been able to access the depth in my mind where it's already calm, which for me, I like to liken it to the inner contentment that was underneath my discontentment that kept driving me back to drugs and alcohol. So now I don't need to reach outside of myself when I seek a change in my emotional state. I have a way to produce that change from within. As one of my spiritual teachers, Gabrielle Bernstein, who's also got sober through the 12 step process has been sober. I love Gabby Bernstein. My, my wife introduced me to her a couple months ago. Sorry for interrupting. But no, please. That's, she's, she's like she's one of my favorites and I've done her spirit junkie masterclass, which I'd recommend to everybody, which is essentially like how to begin your journey as an entrepreneur. That really helped me on my journey. And she says meditation recalibrates your energy back to the frequency of love. And so one of the ways to change our state is to change our focus. And through meditation, we recalibrate our energy back to the frequency of love. We're able to act, especially with this technique in particular, because I'm not trying to stop my thoughts. I learned the correct mechanics to go beneath them to the place in my mind where it's already calm. And I'm able to access that. Chemicals I believe us. that we and all have this. Through this technique, you're easily able to access those. And so I don't need to reach outside of myself when I seek a change in my emotional state, nor do I seek one as often because every day, because we suggest meditating every morning and every evening, I'm accessing that inner reservoir of bliss chemicals. So I don't have that feeling in me that I need to change that I don't know how to change from within. Wow. So what are, what are some misconceptions that you hear about meditation? There's three big ones. The first one is that in order to be successful, uh, you have to clear your mind in order to successfully meditate. And again, we teach people that meditation is not about stopping your thoughts. It's about accessing the silence that's underneath them, but is usually overshadowed by all our mind's activity. So the biggest misconception is in order to be successful, I have to be able to clear my mind. And we teach people again, how to access that inner contentment by learning the correct mechanics of this practice. Meaning like one of the gifts of sobriety, I moved to California. I got to actually teach meditation yoga at Deepak Chopra Center for Wellbeing for about a year. And I drove there and back in my car. And that car is super beneficial to get me to where I want to go, but not if I don't know how to drive it. And so in my in-depth four-session course where I teach you how to become a self-sufficient meditator, I teach people how to drive the vehicle so they can access the inner contentment and so they can let go of the misconception that in order to be successful, they have to clear their mind. The other two I was going to mention was uh, you have to sit like a monk in order to be able to meditate successfully, meaning like legs crossed, back straight, fingers in like, you know, a certain fancy, what in yoga they call mudra, which is like a different hand position. And the cool thing that I've learned in that the school of thought that I teach meditation from, which is from a body of knowledge called the Vedas, what they teach is that when we meditate, we actually access what is actually proven by science as a verifiable 
four state of consciousness. So there's the waking state, which we've all experienced, the dream state, and the deep sleep state, which is sleep without dreams. But through this meditation technique, we actually access what a doctor at Harvard Medical School discovered is called the relaxation response, which is the response in our body that counterbalances and reverses the effects of our body's stress response, the fight flight response. And he discovered that there were certain requirements to be able to easily access this state of restful awareness while meditating. And he discovered that one of them was a comfortable seat with back support. And I think that's very relevant to people in recovery because they think like, I can't clear my mind. I can't sit oh, yeah. like that. I can't sit like that either. I teach yoga. My <laughs> hips are so tight. There's no way I'm going to be able to sit like that. And all I'm going to be thinking about if I am is my discomfort. And one of the last misconceptions I want to bring up is this idea that if you meditate, all your problems are going to go away. And I think that's super important for people in recovery to know is that going back to Gabrielle Bernstein, she says, the spiritual path is not about being the best meditator, the kindest person, or the most enlightened. It's about how quick when you fall off the wagon, you get back on. And so the thing about meditation is, is because I'm doing it every morning and every evening, I fall off all the time. But then I'm meditating and I'm recalibrating my energy back to the frequency of love. I'm finding that balance. Each time I meditate, I'm, I feel a little bit happier. I feel a little bit nicer. I feel a little bit kinder. My intuition becomes a little bit stronger. And each time I meditate, I'm being brought back to that place of balance. I'm getting back on the wagon. And I think that a lot of people think that when you meditate, all your problems are going to go away. And the way that I explain that misconception and really what takes place is that I say meditation is not going to stop your car from not starting, meaning like I might get up tomorrow to go to work and my car may still not start. However, it's going to change the way I respond to it. And so now because of this technique that I practice, the inner quietness that I establish in meditation starts to carry with me the more and more I do this longer and longer throughout my day. So now there's like this buffer zone between the time a stress factor shows up and between the time I respond to it. When before, when stress would just show up, I'd react to it. And enough times of just reacting to it over and over and over again made me so restless, irritable, and discontent that I would always end up back at a drink or drug. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about how the meditation, it can help you as far as you get the thoughts in your head where it's like, I don't like this stressor. This is really irking me. I need to go back to a drink or a drug. So meditation helps put that buffer in there. So is there a parallel between the recovery aspect of it and the entrepreneurship aspect of it? Because we all know that business owners, uh, I'd be willing to bet have a little more stress than the average bear. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. My One of my best, most beloved meditation teachers, Emily Fletcher, she just wrote this book, Stress Less and Accomplish More. And one of the things that I've learned from Emily, whose course I've taken and is one of the reasons I'm where I'm at in the meditation space today, is that a lot of the meditation techniques, as I was saying earlier today, are mindfulness. It's the art of bringing our attention back into the present. These are really good for helping us feel better in the moment. And I'd suggest that people still practice techniques that, you know, use this form of meditation during the day when you feel like, because the technique that I teach is something that you do every morning and every evening so that inner quietness can carry with you. You can steep your day in stillness and silence before you start it. And then you can kind of recenter yourself so you can be present for the rest of your evening by doing it again in the late afternoon or early evening. So it isn't a technique where each time you're stressed out, you stop and you do it. But by doing it every morning and every evening, you're less stressed more often. And so one of the things that I've learned though from her is that the difference is that in this technique, what's happening is, is that our body is a perfect accountant, meaning somewhere in our body and in our mind, we store all that stress, tension, and fatigue from our past in our cellular memory. And what this technique does is it goes in and it helps us get rid of that backlog of stress so then we can perform at the top of our game in our life. And so how it relates to entrepreneurship is like, hey, if I'm less stressed, my mind's going to be clearer. 
I'm going to have more clear cut guidance about what I need to be doing and what the next best step is for me on my journey as an entrepreneur. And I'm just going to be able to handle the demands that entrepreneurship requires in a much more calm manner where I'll be able to sustain as an entrepreneur for much longer because it's, I'm going to be less stressed. So things are going to flow much more easily and effortless on that journey as an entrepreneur. That's awesome. So you also have an ebook. Do you want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I just, um, on my website, which is uh, georgespeterson.com, released an ebook. And the ebook is using meditation to thrive in your life and recovery. So it's a free ebook that you can go on and download. And it's going to teach you all about the ways that meditation can help you thrive in your life and your recovery. As I said, my biggest goal is to share meditation with as many people in recovery as possible. And I wanted to create this ebook so people could see the value and the role meditation can play in helping you thrive in your life and thrive in overcoming your negative habits and addictive behaviors. So in it, I talk about all kinds of things, everything from stress and how when we experience stress, it releases what are called stress hormones in our body. And those are, things like adrenaline and noradrenaline. And these things cause us anxiety and insomnia and that nonstop stress will lead to chronic stress like addictions. Because again, that discontentment from all those stress hormones in our body will lead us to seeking a change in our emotional state through things like food, sex, drugs, and alcohol. So I talk about the role stress plays in causing addiction and how meditation can counterbalance and reverse the effects to stress in our lives. I also talk about things in the ebook, like how meditation can actually help us heal addiction at a global level. Cause I believe, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this. Like I've worked with so many people in recovery, trying to help them not only overcome their negative habits, but live their best life. And out of the hundreds, if not thousands of people I've been able to come into contact with and offer definite and valuable suggestions to only a handful of them are still sober. Yeah, man. I believe that the problem goes way beyond just me being able to help one person at a time or a group of people maybe who come to my meditation course or next weekend, I'm actually teaching meditation for the whole weekend at a big recovery conference up in New Hampshire. Awesome. As awesome as that is, I think in order to heal addiction at a global level, kids need to have a set of tools from the start to be able to produce a change in their emotional state from within. So when they seek a change in their emotional state, they don't have to reach for something outside of themselves. And so what I talk about is that this idea that we're all connected at a non-local level, meaning the same love, truth, and beauty that's within me is within everybody else. They did this study, the Transcendental Meditation Organization, which I don't teach Transcendental Meditation, but the mechanics come from the same lineage. It's an ancient Vedic meditation technique as well. And they did a study called the Maharishi Effect, which showed that if you brought 10, 1% of a population into an inner city and had them all meditate using this technique that uses the same mechanics as the one that I teach it would lower the crime rate every single time by 10%. Wow. And so, yeah, and they've actually studied this and been able to prove that it's true. And so even though I believe in today's world, we're all impacted by addiction in one form or another. If we don't have a negative habit or addictive behavior, which if anybody's listening is really just as one of my yoga teachers, Tommy Rosen, who does a lot of work in the addiction recovery field says, Addiction is any behavior you continue to do despite the fact it brings negative consequences. But what I tell people is even if you feel like you're that one person who doesn't have addiction, meditation is so important because when enough of us do it, it will create a global shift because we're all connected at a non-local level, which then will create a more happy, just, sustainable, loving, peaceful, healthy world. When enough of us shift the way we move to the world, the whole world will shift. So I get into things like that in my ebook and just the role meditation plays in overcoming, you know, our negative habits and addictive behaviors, no matter what they are, whether that's food, sex, alcohol, or drugs, et cetera. So the, the addictive personality is more of what the issue is. It's like the drugs and the alcohol. That's just a symptom of that discontent on the inside. 
So is that, is that sort of what you're getting at? Yeah. And I mean, here's the thing for me about meditation. Two things come to mind when you say that is like, there's a quote by Light Watkins, who is an amazing meditation teacher himself, who says, meditate every morning for 20 minutes and your intuition will become louder and clearer. And on my journey in recovery, because I picked up a toolkit that's been laid at my feet, the number one tool being meditation, but other tools as well. For me, I do affirmations. I visualize. I go to a 12-step group. I help other people in recovery. The tools that have gotten me where I'm at in recovery are the same tools I'm using to thrive as an entrepreneur in recovery. And what I've learned is that those things also lead me to the awareness of what's no longer serving me in my life. And going back to your question, you know, the drugs and alcohol aren't the problem. When I put down the drugs and alcohol, I'm more crazy off drugs and alcohol than I am on them. They were the solution, not the problem. Exactly. And I remember, it's funny you said that. I was listening to a podcast this morning with one guy I heard when I was first in recovery and he said, drugs and alcohol weren't my problem. They were my solution. I was like, holy shit, they were. They were my solution to me not feeling so discontent in my own skin. There's a quote that says, all of man's problems stem from his inability to sit alone in a room quietly. And I couldn't be with myself by myself and be okay. And I put down the drugs and alcohol. Yeah. And if I don't have a, a toolkit laid at my feet and I'm not doing things like meditating, I'm doing all kinds of even crazier shit. And what I've discovered after I got sober and I actually started to engage in positive habits to not only put down the drinker and the drug, but change the person that I was so I didn't have to do crazy stuff in recovery anymore is that when I pick up these tools that help me as an entrepreneur, whether that's visualizing every day, whether that's meditating, whether that's praying, I'm also led in my recovery to all those other behaviors that are underneath my drugs and alcohol that are the real problem that are no longer serving me. So like what that looked like for me in the beginning was like, I wasn't eating healthy. And I realized that like eating a box of little Debbie's a day wasn't going to serve me. And then I realized that pornography was a huge addiction for me. And so now I'm sober from pornography too. And I help other men also get sober from their pornography addiction. And what I know today, as you said, is like drugs and alcohol aren't the problem they were the solution to my problem. And when I put down the drugs and alcohol, I become even crazier than I was when I had them. And so yeah, through all these different, you know, tools that I've been shown in recovery by taking suggestions from other people, I've been able to change these behaviors. So I change because recovery for me today isn't about not drinking. I'm not like struggling to stay away from heroin or alcohol on a daily basis. Yeah, I'm struggling to live my life along spiritual guidelines make sure I'm meditating every day, make sure I'm praying. It's not about not drinking. I need to be doing things that are going to help me live my best life and put me in a position to be a maximum service to the world. Recovery isn't for me just about not drinking today. It's about being loving, kind, patient, tolerant, meditating every day, exercising, eating right. When I'm doing that and I'm showing up as the best version of myself for the world and I'm thriving in my life as an entrepreneur and I'm helping other people do the same, that's recovery for me today. You know, if someone's, someone's listening to this and they may be still in the grips of addiction or maybe they have a week, two weeks, month, not a substantial amount of time in the grand scheme of things. Sure. I know for myself, it was my baseline right? We'll say this is a, uh, this is like a two out of 10, right? Sure. And when I wake up, I wake up at a two and as my day progresses, it gets worse and worse and worse. And then when I drink, <laughs> I bring it back up to a two. So that's what we mean by the alcohol and drugs were the solution because my life, my baseline's at a two and life sucks without it. And so the solution, it brings it up to a two, but then there's consequences that come along with it bring it up, drink, get high. I'm back at a two, but there's still this eight out of 10 that I've been completely missing. And then once I discovered that if I keep away from the drugs and alcohol, which, you know, I saw all the negative side effects and consequences just in my life that were very, very obvious. My baseline when I wake up now is like an eight. Totally easy. Like I wake up at an eight, 
pretty consistently. And I mean, my, my wife just gave birth to our son, uh, Jack. Congratulations. And so even now I'm still waking up at like a seven with like two hours of sleep here and there. I'm totally. still, still hitting that. And, you know, I never would have been able to do that without having the tools like meditation and being able to sit still with myself. As far as, so you've got the ebook out. Are you looking for anything else as far as publishing goes? Or is it, you're just going to do the ebook, see how that goes? What's the future look like as far as your writing goes? Yeah. So real quick, I just wanted to bounce back to that point you just made, which was that now my baseline's an eight. I'm waking up at usually at least an eight every day. And I, I've been saying this a lot, even when I go to a 12 step group is that being an alcoholic and a drug addict is actually the greatest gift anybody could have been given because definitely what it's actually done is placed us in a position where we have to enlarge our spiritual life on a daily basis. And so it doesn't have to look for you the exact same way as it does for me. But when you pick up a spiritual toolkit, the beauty of it is, is not only will it help you stop drinking, but it will help you live your best life and thrive no matter what it is you want to do. And you'll probably intuitively understand what it is that you're supposed to be doing with your life if you keep picking that toolkit up. And how that relates to being an entrepreneur too is that it's like now that I've got sober and I was placed in this position where I had to enlarge my spiritual life, it's like I picked up this toolkit and it's put me in a position where I can be an entrepreneur and now I have the tools to successfully be an entrepreneur. So getting into recovery was the greatest gift I'd been given because I was placed in a position where I had to learn the tools that not only helped me stop drinking, but now are helping me show up as the best version of myself and live my best life and have these experiences has happened in my life that I never would have imagined possible. You know, they say when you get sober, write down what you'd have in five years. Like I eat plant-based and I teach Ayurveda, which is a 5,000 year old healthcare system from India. I didn't even know what those two things were when I got sober. And so that's the beauty of it is like these tools that you'll learn on your journey in sobriety, you can apply to doing anything you want with your life, whether that's being an entrepreneur or anything, anything is possible. You just have to get it sober and pick up that toolkit that's laid at your feet, find people who have what you want and do what they do. And so as far as the writing goes, yeah. So the ebook was really just the start. So I'm actually writing a book right now. It's called the missing piece. And it's going to be four steps to creating an enjoyable meditation practice should be done by the end of this year. I'm planning on having a publisher by the end of this year and hoping to get it out in the beginning of 2020. And so I actually call meditation Medi with my friends. We joke around, we call it Medi. And so I turned Medi into an acronym to help people learn how to meditate very easily and effortlessly, and especially people in recovery. And the reason it's called the missing piece is because I believe that meditation is the missing piece to take your life to the next level, especially if you're in recovery. And so I took that Medi technique and made it super simple so people could find meditation simple and easy and use it to thrive in their life as somebody in recovery and an entrepreneur. That's so cool. So what is, I'm curious, what, what does the process look like? I mean, writing is one of those things, like for myself, every, every year or so, I'll write a just insane bucket list of things that I know will never happen. And the crazy <laughs> thing is, you know, you want to talk law of attraction. Um, in 2017, I wrote a list of here's a ton of things that'll never happen, but ha ha ha. And I swear, I, I probably wrote out 50 different things and probably 10 of them actually happened in 2018. So repeating that practice in 2018, going to 2019, it was like, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. So what is, what does writing look like? Cause one of, one of the things I had on there and without any huge writing background, I wrote New York times bestseller. And it was like, well, I've never, I've never written a book, but you know, be on that. And then I look at what are my motives behind it? But I, anyway, that's enough, enough about me, but what, what does the process look like for you writing? Well, I think one of the biggest things with writing is that, um, rather than trying to like force content out of my brain, I usually every time before I write, and I actually learned this from Gabrielle Bernstein as well as I write at the top of the page, I call on the guidance of the highest truth and compassion to guide my pen. And relating writing back to meditation, I start my day every morning with meditation. And there's a quote that says, the quieter you become, the more you'll hear. That's by Rumi, a 13th century Sufi poet. 
that's been my experience is because I start my day by meditating and because I, I usually pray too. And I'll say a prayer, like, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And what do you want me to say? And usually not always, like there's definitely times where I go through writer's block, but it's not like to, I'm writing about something I haven't been studying for the past seven years on a daily <laughs> basis. So the information is definitely already contained within me, but in the past, when I would write stuff like my blogs or once I created a guided meditation series that's on inside timer before I really got into like teaching the self-sufficient stillness and silence practice that I teach today. When I'd write that stuff, a lot of times I'd always like look at other people's stuff and use that to inspire my ideas. And now I just study and study and study. And then I ask for guidance and usually what I'm supposed to write flows through me from that space. That's great. That's really cool. I know uh, Tim Ferriss, I think his, his style, I think he has like a daily goal and it's write 300 crappy words. That's his, and then it gets you into the mindset and then it keeps going. Well, and usually my goal right now for writing my book, cause I want to finish it this year. It's like my top goal for 2019 is to write my book on the Medi, I call it the Medi technique and you know, teach people, especially people in recovery, these four steps to creating an enjoyable meditation practice. I committed to 25 minutes a day. And like, there's some days where I fall short, but for the most part, I pretty much fall through with that on a daily basis. And sometimes it becomes more. Mm -hmm. like if I'm in the zone, I'm not going to like stop my pen in the middle of a sentence and be like, Oh, it's been 25 minutes. Yeah. But you know, today, for instance, I have a good friend here. Um, who's in recovery, instead of writing for 25 minutes, I'm going to go over my book with him for 25 minutes and get his feedback and have him help me edit it. And so I'm trying to do one thing every day, which usually means write every day for 25 minutes. And that way I'm staying in action. And, you know, they say repetitions, the mother of skill. So that's yeah. another thing. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to be in recovery, like repetition, repetition, like you might suck at first, but when the time is on you, just start yeah. and that pressure will be off. And I just start and I'm taking action and repetition. And because I just keep going, even when things are in the unknown and unsure, I'm persistent long enough where I get to the place where I end up getting results. Yeah. And there's this book called Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business. And we had re recently implemented a lot of the, it's called the EOS, the Entrepreneur entrepreneur operating system, entrepreneurial operating system, EOS. And they describe these things called rocks. And it was from another book too. And I don't remember the citation on it, but essentially they say, you know, imagine that you have a jar and in that jar, you have rocks, pebbles, sand, and water. And the water is the day-to-day -day stuff that just pops up. The sand is the things that you do, but you know, anybody can do just parts of your day, responding to an email, things of that nature. The pebbles are the things that are semi important, but you know, it's just, it's most of what your job consists of, but then there's the rocks and the rocks are the things that are the most important thing to you. So for in this, in this instance, your rock is writing the book. Totally. And the way that they put it is if you put, in the jar, if you put the water and then the sand and then the pebbles, there won't be enough room for the rocks. Mm. So putting the priority of put the rock in first, put the pebbles in next, put the sand in next and having priorities laid out, you will achieve your goal just by virtue of having the priorities. Because, you know, like I said, in my life, I had put it on the list to, to write a book and it's not something that's really a big priority for me right now. And as a result, that's not one of my rocks. So I don't, I don't put time into it and I'm not like surprised, you know, that this book isn't magically writing itself, <laughs> but you know, you've established my rock is writing this book. There's 25 minutes every day. I guarantee you, if you didn't set aside time for them, you could find other things, be it pebbles, sand, water that throw off your day 
and then you won't be able to hit the goal. So that's. Oh. And sometimes I do. Oh yeah. 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 I'm, sometimes yeah. I'll put the pebbles in the sand before the rock and then I'll be like, shit, it's 11 o'clock and I forgot my 25 minutes of writing my most important goal, you know, and going back to how meditation helps us as an entrepreneur. It's like, meditation spontaneously leads us to where we need to be led. That's what been my experience. And one of the things it's done is it's put me, as I said, in relationship with people who have what I want and then I've taken their suggestions. And one of the things that I've been taught, if you look in the back corner of my room, I learned this from Jesse, the guy you had on your last podcast is that have a goal board, write all my goals on there and come up. I have nine goals for this year, my top goals. And those are my nine rocks. Yeah. And because those are right there, I'm trying to only schedule like, you know, three to five tasks that are in alignment with moving me toward those rocks each day. The number one being write my book for 25 minutes. And because I'm clear on what those rocks are. Those are the only things I should really be making time for. And sure, there's still pebbles and there's still sand in my life. Absolutely. But I'm getting better at better at not even worrying about those until the rocks are in place. Yeah. And without meditation, without quieting your mind, it's very, very difficult to not just deal with 100%. the water and the sand because those are usually easy things too. They're usually okay, I'll reply to this email. I'm going to exactly check out this article on Buzzfeed or something that it's not going to have a big impact on your life. And for us, email marketing is one of the big things for our company. And, you know, we put together these drip campaigns, which I'd consider an asset. And there's a whole slew of asset liability and time wasters. But we'll just say, once I put together an automation for an email campaign, once I put that in there and it's set up automatically, I have taken the hour or however long it takes to write that email copy and it will forever be hitting people the same way, different customers over and over and over through different parts of their customer journey with us and just narrowing it down to the simplest form. But I wrote an email in 2015 and we set up the automation with it that email that I wrote in 2015. So I spent one hour in 2015 and it did multiple five figures in sales automatically last year. And I very well, I remember I was writing it when I was in Chicago with my then girlfriend, now wife, we were, we were watching TV and I pulled out my laptop and I was like, you know, I need to focus on our marketing a bit. Let me write this. And it, it took off immediately, which was great. And the company blew up a lot more in 2016, 17 and so on. So, but taking that time to do things that actually mattered because I could have paid more attention yeah. to modern family and watch that rerun for the 10th time, but I focused on what was important and that's exactly what you're doing. And that's, that's great. You have the goals right there in your face every day so that you can prioritize what is actually important in your life. Because if you don't set your priorities and adjust your life accordingly, your life will, will go into what other people's priorities are. If you don't set your own. You hit the nail on the head, you know, and it goes back to that idea that I made earlier because the meditation technique I practice gets rid of that backlog of stress. I'm more able to perform at the top of my game. My head's not so all over the place. I'm clear on what needs to get done first, what my number one is for the day. And then I can put my time on that. And I don't like trick myself as often now because I'm not so caught up in that backlog of stress that just causes me to get distracted with my emails on what my rock is and where my time and focus needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, nonprofit that you're working with? Yeah. So unfortunately, um, one of my best friends in recovery who I've done a lot of work with, who's an awesome yoga teacher, her name's Jillian Hannah. Her brother just OD'd of a, died of a heroin overdose. And so her parents in lieu of, um, flowers decided to donate all the money to the work that I'm doing to bring more meditation and yoga to people in recovery. And I have a company called nourish with my partner. And the idea is if you don't take time to nourish yourself, you can't take time to nourish anybody else. And that's what we teach people in recovery. And like the same thing about being an entrepreneur, like you can't pour from an empty cup. 
And so what we do is we host three hour mindful events where the first hour is yoga. The second 30 minutes is meditation using the technique that I talked about in the last hour and a half is a three course plant-based meal where we talk about like spirituality or entrepreneurship or goal setting or healthy living. And we're giving people the tools it takes to be an entrepreneur and live their best life. And I decided that I was going to start a nonprofit in her brother's name. His name was Jordan Hanna. So it's going to be the Jordan Hanna Recovery and Wellbeing Group. And what we're going to do is we're going to host these events for big groups of people, specifically people in recovery, where, you know, again, first hours yoga, second 30 minutes of meditation, then we're going to serve a three course plant-based meal and talk about healthy living. But all the money that comes into the foundation that we raise is going to go to helping people in recovery who can't afford it to come to these events. Everybody who comes and all the money that we raise, all the money is going to go back into the nonprofit to keep bringing these events to more and more people. Because I want to give people, as I said, it's not for me about not drinking. Like I have to do that. That's the baseline. If I even want to do anything good with my life, it's about me helping people thrive. I really believe that like, if we can access that inner contentment underneath our discontentment, Mm -hmm. we could stop so many things from happening that are bad in this world right now. And so I want to give people the tools to be able to do that because not only is that going to help them thrive because they say, you know, align yourself with the vibrational frequency of that, which you want to attract. So if you're tapping into your inner bliss chemicals every day, you're going to be more happier. You're going to be more nicer. You're going to be more kinder. Your desires are going to be fulfilled more easily because you're not going to be struggling on a daily basis to like press up against something that's not going to go your way. You know, your intuition is going to be stronger. You're going to be less stressed. You're going to have more inner peace. How are not all of these qualities going to help you be an entrepreneur, live your best life. And so we want to share these things with as many people as possible. And also we've learned eating healthy, how important that is. And so we have this company and now we're going to be hosting these events through the nonprofit to bring these tools to as many people in recovery as possible so they can live their best life. So if they want to become an entrepreneur, they'll have the tools to be able to do that. So they can be tapped into their bliss chemicals to that power greater than themselves to their most universal self. And not only that, so they can have fun in recovery. Like these events are fun. Like we actually had Jesse, your last guy on the podcast present at one of them. And he did a whole thing on goal setting and he led people through a goal setting exercise. And we're going to be doing two events with the nonprofit that use these things called sound off headphones, which are these headphones where you can flick through different channels. And we're going to do a silent disco with headphones for people in recovery. And we're going to do a yoga class where everybody's listening to the music for the yoga class in their headphones. And so it's going to probably be called the Jordan. I'm getting it approved right now by the state, but it's in the process and I've received the money for, um, you know, for her brother's unfortunate death. And I'm using all the money to give these tools, meditation, yoga, plant-based food, spirituality, all these tools for living their best life to as many people in recovery as possible through this nonprofit that I'm starting. So we're super excited about it. It's going to be me, this girl, Jill, whose brother unfortunately passed and my girlfriend, who's the chef running these events and just, we're going to be hopefully traveling to as many places around the country as possible in renting spaces that have a place for with a kitchen and a big enough space for yoga and meditation and just inviting as many people in recovery to come as possible and donate so we can keep getting this out there to the world to share with as many people as possible. That's awesome, man. So in wrapping up, what, what action can listeners take to take their business to the next level? Oh, that's a loaded question. I mean, there's a lot of them. I'd say the few that come to mind are, you know, they say we're the sum total of the five people we surround ourselves with most. Who's in your inner circle? Figure that out and get some people who inspire you around you, who can get you out of your comfort zone, help you take that leap, step into the unknown and, and, and trust the universe has your back by being willing to go out there and be persistent at trying to live your best life. Um, Another thing that came to mind was what we've been talking about this whole call, which is like success leaves clues. So like find people who have what you want and do what they do. Like if you feel like meditation um, seems like you, you know, after this conversation, you're attracted to it, like find me or find another meditation teacher to go talk to. You know, if you go to a yoga class and you're inspired by that, like ask the yoga teacher, like what she does to live her best life. 
if you go to a 12 step group and somebody there seems like they're thriving in their recovery, like ask them how they got there. And then everybody selfishly, I'm going to say should meditate because I think that whether you're an entrepreneur and you're going to meditate and get rid of the backlog of stress so you can perform better at the top of your game or you're in recovery and you want to be able to access that inner contentment so you don't have to reach for it in drugs and alcohol, meditate. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, finishing up, George, how can people find you? I know that you have get involved, get in touch with you and get moving forward with that. Thank you for bringing this up. I have a four session in-depth meditation course where I teach people how to become a self-sufficient meditator. If you want to learn more about that and you want to learn more about those four sessions, if you go on my website, it's georgespeterson.com. You can click on the tab that says meditation. You can schedule a free introduction to my primordial sound meditation course. You'll see that right on there and you can schedule that with me and you can learn more about the course and then we'll get you signed up and get you going on that. And know that if money's the only obstacle to you going through that course, like I offer payment plans and we'll work out a payment plan that's affordable for you um, because I really want to share this tool and get the world meditating with as many people as possible. So on my website is probably the best place hop on there go on and uh, sign up for that free introduction to primordial sound meditation as well as check out nourish that company where we host those three hours mindful events or i do health consultations using ayurvedic health all that stuff's on my website georgespeterson.com my free ebook you know if nothing else if you're still not sold and you're not ready to sign up for the free introduction to primordial sound meditation before getting involved in the course, go on there and download my ebook and read about how meditation can help you thrive in your life and recovery. So if you are an entrepreneur listening to this who's not in recovery, this is also going to be valuable information to learn how meditation can help us thrive in our life. And that's all free on my website. Awesome. Well, George, it was so great having you on the show and anything else before, before we wrap up really just, I wanted to thank you for the work you're doing and your time. Um, I'm grateful for just being able to chat with somebody like yourself who's helping a lot of people in recovery. You know, I think that we have to ask ourselves how strong our link is in the chain and it's what it's really about is one of my you know, I went on a week long meditation yoga retreat and there was a guy who wrote the book, the conversations with God, Neil Donald Walsh. And he talked about how our purpose in life is to express and experience who we really are and who we really are is love. And he said that, uh, you, have you ever heard the saying that nobody comes into your life without a gift for you in their hand? He said, it's actually backwards. You don't come into anybody's life without a gift for them in your hand. And so what I'd say is, you know, find out what it is that sets your soul on fire and then figure out how you can use that to help other people. Awesome. And I I appreciate that. And that, that really was the driving force behind the podcast. You know, my mentor was like, Hey, you know, you can build authority for your coaching business by starting a podcast, have entrepreneurs. And I was like, I'm going to one up that and try to help people who are also in recovery. You know, I mean, how many success podcasts out there are there? right now. So, I mean, it's, it's a little more niched and I feel like I can really give back to the community. That's literally given me everything that I have. I mean, my, I had nothing to show for my life six years ago and in one month today, yeah, the 23rd when we're recording this. So March 23rd will be my uh, six years of sobriety, which is incredible. So with that, George, thank you so much for being on the show. And, um, you know, until next time people can find you at www.georgespeterson.com sign up for the free introductory course and check out the ebook. Yeah. Thanks and thanks again. for being on the show, man. I appreciate no, I it. I really appreciate thank your time. Hey, this is Andrew. And I just wanted to thank you so much for listening to self-made and sober. As you know, I'm a business coach, and if you're interested in taking your business to the next level, go to lasisecoaching.com slash 30. That's L-A-S-S-I-S-E coaching.com slash three zero and sign up for a free 30 minute business coaching session. I've helped tons of entrepreneurs grow their businesses from pure chaos to six, seven, and even eight figure operations. 
Heck, I even 48X'd my own company from year one to year two, and I know I can do the same for you because I've been there and I want to help. So that's LaCeaseCoaching.com slash 30. And again, thank you so much for listening to Self Made and Sober, and be sure to subscribe if you like the episode.